Shelley, uh, we just did a study in humans in septic shock giving volume and found that in systolic elastins increased with fluid resuscitation in over half the patients that paper we're submitting soon. But we measured contractility, um, which was quite amazing. Uh, and I agree, our uh, norepinephrine is an excellent agent. We're now going to talk about personalized blood pressure targets and my usual conflicts of interest. Okay, why do you even worry about the blood pressure being low in the first place? Why are you upset when your patient becomes hypotensive? And the reason you are is because that perfusion pressure allows for the adequate regional blood flow autoregulation. Every organ is as communistic as you can be. It takes only what it needs, nothing more. So if it needs more oxygen because its metabolic demand goes up, it dilates up, decreasing its resistance, and it gets flow. But if it doesn't need the oxygen, it stays vasoconstricted, and even if you have a high arterial pressure, it won't increase the flow to that region. We refer to this as autoregulation. Below that pressure, however, you have ischemic organ dysfunction, and the other term for that is circulatory shock. Within this context, we have to understand what are the determinants of organ blood flow. And on your arterial side, we have a very high central arterial pressure, which is mean arterial pressure, arterial pulse pressure. And then we have a high input resistance to the various organs at the arteriolar and precapillary level. <clears throat> there is essentially no arterial resistance. And that's because if you, there was an arterial resistance, you couldn't measure mean arterial pressure with a radial artery catheter. But you can. So there's no resistance between the radial artery and the aorta. It's all one great big capacitor. The primary method by which organs increase their blood flow is by local vasodilation. And within this context of autoregulation, cardiac output is only important to maintain pressure. I agree completely with Shelley that cardiac output is our goal, but the reason it is our goal is to maintain the pressure so we can have autoregulation of blood flow. So the rational defense for maintaining blood pressure is to have an autoregulation of blood flow. Furthermore, I don't have to invent septic shock to lose autoregulation. I just have to have a hypotensive patient. And if they're hypotensive, they can't autoregulate blood flow no matter what. This is a picture from Milner's textbook of a human being's arterial pressure profile. And as you can see, I assume you can see the, no, you can't. Okay, I'm going to show it on this one. As you can see, I guess I'm not, oh well. The blood pressure, which is the line at the top, the mean one, doesn't change very much up until you get to the arterioles. And then the pressure falls really sharp. The bottom part, of the curve is the average resistances at that point in time. And as you can see, the resistances in our arterial cardiovascular venous circuit is concentrated on the arteriolar and precapillary sphincter level. On the arteriolar level, that's primarily the alpha-adrenergic stimulation. That's why norepinephrine works there and why it causes radial artery pressure to rise because the resistance is downstream from where you're measuring. But the precapillary sphincters and the tissue pressure are regulating the closing pressure. So a few years ago, Jose Marquez and I measured aortic flow and arterial pulse pressure in human beings. And we plotted in human beings the arterial pulse pressure and stroke volume during an instantaneous decrease in venous return by occluding the inferior vena cava. And if you extrapolate this arterial pressure flow relationship to a zero stroke volume, you would end up with a pressure that the vasculature is e extracted to zero, which is not CVP. It is significantly higher than CVP. It has been referred to as the pressure at zero flow, PZF, or the critical closing pressure of the vasculature. And furthermore, the actual driving pressure for arterial flow is not systemic vascular resistance, but is the resistance that is present between the mean arterial pressure and that critical closing pressure. 
and this is referred to as a vascular waterfall, as demonstrated by this picture of people sitting on the edge of a vascular waterfall, so to speak. This is Victoria Falls. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the rate at which water falls over this waterfall has nothing to do with how far it goes once it drops over the edge. The only thing that determines the rate of water flow over this waterfall is going to be the height upstream relative to the edge. That pressure gradient times divided by the resistance is going to be the driving pressure for our, our flow through that organ. By the way, I'm going to be sitting there, and I'll show you that picture in a second. So, this is the same picture you saw from the human beings before. This is the pressure flow relationship of cardiac output versus arterial pressure, and we refer to the change in pressure if changed in flow to resistance. An increase in resistance, I would need a greater pressure for the same increase in flow, and a decrease in resistance, I'd need a lesser pressure for the same increase in flow. Well, we looked at this in our laboratory back in 1989, and with David Kramer, we measured the individual flows of the kidney, gut, and liver and showed that, in fact, they have quite different resistances, and they have quite different zero flow intercept points. As you can see, the kidney is very decreased resistance, very high flow changes. The liver has a very high resistance. And if you've ever taken care of a liver transplant patient, you know they need a high mean arterial pressure because they drop about 30 millimeters of mercury when the, the pressure gets to the porta hepatis and the hepatic artery because the hepatic artery has, has such a high resistance. Okay. But as Shelley was showing, showing you before, the kidney, because it has such a low resistance, is a setup for ischemia. Because if I were simply to decrease the mean arterial pressure, I would see a greater proportional decrease in blood flow to the kidney than the other organs, not only because their slopes are different, but their waterfalls are different. So with Juanita Moss on her PhD thesis, we went into the OR and we actually measured venous return and arterial pressure using an inspiratory hold technique so that we had progressively decreasing cardiac output. What I want to show you here is the mean arterial pressure cardiac outputs over a 10-second inspiratory hold maneuver. And you can see in a human being, this critical closing pressure in this person was approximately 35 millimeters of mercury. Their mean systemic pressure, that pressure out there in Shelley's bathtub, was about 20. So this difference between 35 and 20 is the vascular waterfall. Okay? The causes of this increase in tone are many, both endothelial, myogenic, and metabolic. And Shelley mentioned nitric oxide, but there are other processes that work on this as well. When we look at the various organs in terms of whether or not they're going to have proper autoregulation, they're different. The heart, the brain, the kidney really try to maintain flow very tightly relative to their metabolic demands. So if you drink a lot of fluids, your kidneys decrease their resistance and you pee out a lot more urine. If you exercise, your coronaries dilate up and you use more oxygen to air. If you think, your cerebral blood flow goes up by twice as much. There's moderate autoregulation for skeletal and splanchnic and none for the skin to speak of. The skin changes its flow primarily to alter temperature control. So if I were to look at a blood flow, and now I'm going to plot this versus perfusion pressure, not mean arterial pressure, a totally dilated system, remember, would have a really steep slope, and that's dilated. A very constricted system would have a very low slope. So if I want to look at an organ and say, what is its flow relative to its perfusion pressure, and I start high, I would see that the organ perfusion pressure, if you're really high, would be a function of the flow. But when you get down into the autoregulatory range, the flow remains relatively constant despite changes in pressure. For very high pressures, you blow out that autoregulation, and that's the reason why hypertension causes um, uh, cerebral injury because of the swelling of the brain from excessive flow. Now, the reason that this autoregulation occurs is active changes in the vasomotor tone of the periphery. When you're treating a patient in shock, the only thing you care about is being above that circle. 
you want to be in the autoregulatory range because when you're below the autoregulatory range, flow is totally a function of pressure and that's called circulatory shock. And that's really dangerous because if you go over the other side, you are dead. That's Victoria Falls. So what is the perfusion pressure? It is not mean arterial pressure. It is input pressure minus output pressure. And we have several input pressures. We have mean arterial pressure and we have diastolic arterial pressure. And for the brain, it's mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure or CVP, inter, or CVP, whichever is higher. For the heart, since it contracts, it cannot perfuse when it's contracted, so it only perfuses when it's relaxed. So it's diastolic pressure minus CVP. For the kidney and the gut, it's mean arterial pressure minus intra-abdominal pressure, or CVP. And for the skeletal muscle, it's mean arterial pressure minus interstitial pressure. So if you have a compartment syndrome, you'll have an ischemic muscle with a normal arterial pressure because the interstitial pressure in the compartment will rise. We went to the various national societies and we reviewed the literature for a paper and found that the recommended mean arterial pressures to maintain various organs are going to be shown in the next few slides. The normal intraoperative cerebral perfusion pressure should be greater than 50 millimeters of mercury and post a CVA neurotrauma, people now are saying it has to be between 50 and 70. Above 70 millimeters of mercury will cause cerebral edema. For the coronary perfusion, 50 millimeters of mercury, coronary perfusion pressure, diastolic pressure minus CVP, should be approximately 50. During CPR, if you want the heart to recover and go back to normal spontaneous circulation, you need to get the CPR perfusion pressure at least 20 millimeters of mercury or the heart will not recover. For the kidney, unlike other organs, it likes a higher pressure, which is the reason why Australians target a mean arterial pressure of 90. But I can't really help you because if I were to look at heart and brain and organ perfusion pressure, remember I told you that we have an autoregulation value is about 65 or so for the mean arterial pressure. But if I have a hypertrophic heart, I'll need a higher pressure. And the kidney, we said, was higher still. But if we have renal vascular disease, I will have a higher level. So there is no one magic mean arterial pressure which will ensure perfusion of all your organs. When we looked at the pressure flow relationships back in 1986 of an animal model in septic shock, we looked at them at baseline, and we induced endotoxic shock, and we showed no change in arterial resistance. But we saw a decrease in the critical closing pressure because the initial thing that happens in septic shock is you lose the glycocalyx of the endothelium, and you can no longer have the precapillary sphincters effectively closing it down. This results in an increase in your vascular capacitance, and it's the reason why in sepsis you have to give them volume right away, even though there's absolutely no volume leaking out as of yet into the tissues. But after about four to six hours, the tone in the periphery falls as inducible nitric oxide synthetase makes nitric oxide and there's vasodilation. So acutely, in a septic patient, you can give them fluid and their blood pressure will come back. But two or three hours later, when they then become hypotensive again, you can still give them fluid if you want, but their blood pressure will only come back if you give them norepinephrine. So what about the organs of the body? David Kramer then looked at the exact same pressure flow relationships of the organs during endotoxic shock and discovered that during endotoxic shock, there is a generalized homogeneity of organ resistances. And that's good for us because it means we can treat all organs the same in terms of treatments. So Ronaldo Belomo in our laboratory with John Kellum looked at the mean pressure flow in the kidney and the gut, and this is the kidney uh, under normal conditions, and he gave a normal dog norepinephrine. And you can see that the, the blood pressure increased, but for the same pressure, the flow went down. So I would tell you, don't give a normal person norepinephrine. It'll decrease renal blood flow. And we already knew that because that's one of the models of acute renal injury that nephrologists have used for years. But then we induced endotoxic shock. And again, there was no change in resistance, but the critical closing pressure decreased. 
in this setting, giving norepinephrine only increased renal perfusion. These are the data that allow you to give a vasoconstrictor, norepinephrine, to a patient in septic shock and expect their gut and their kidney blood flows to increase. It's a good way to be at the edge of the waterfall. What is the pressure that you really want to use? I don't know. In the original study that looked at it, there was no difference between 65, 75, and 85. So a very nice study was done by the French group, Osfar is the first author, published a few years ago in the New England Journal, and they targeted a high mean arterial pressure of 80 to 85 to a low pressure, 75 to 65. But, and you can see the two groups nightly separated for the entire five days of the study. But I want to show you something else. The number 65 isn't even on this graph. Even though the nurses were to target between 75 and 65, they all targeted a higher value. Okay. What was the effect? There was no difference in mortality in the two groups. But far more importantly, if you then separated those patients into those with pre-existing hypertension versus not pre-existing hypertension, the ones with pre-existing hypertension had a higher incidence of renal injury if given the low blood pressure. So if you already had hypertension, 65 to 75, you had more incidence of increased creatinine, more requirements for dialysis. Okay, so why don't we just give everybody norepinephrine and get the high dose? Well, the problem is if you do that, there are more cardiac complications. So although I get more renal injury and need for dialysis if I'm hypertensive with a low dose, Across the board, I get more arrhythmias if I have norepinephrine. So you need to target your patients appropriately. And that's the right way to manage your patients. So the optimal perfusion pressure is the primary determinant of, I'm all done. The uh, perfusion pressure is the primary determinant of organ perfusion above and below the autoregulatory range. Perfusion pressure is not mean arterial pressure. And if you target only mean arterial pressure and don't look at end organ function as a measure of perfusion, you will be in trouble, or at least your patient will. What you want to do is take into account the back pressure, intra-abdominal pressure, intracranial pressure, CVP, and subtract that from the mean arterial pressure. Also, we know that autoregulation in the heart is blunted by hypertrophy, vascular disease, and in the whole body by sepsis. So what do I do? I target initially a mean arterial pressure of 65. That's it. <clears throat> and then I go up or down on the pressure while maintaining flow and looking at end organ function, urine output, mentation, and lactate clearance. Because I know that I cannot possibly know that I'm perfusing every organ accurately in every patient, but this is a very good place to start. If I know the patient had hypertension beforehand, I will target 80 millimeters of mercury as my initial place to start. But I might go down if they can tolerate it because the higher pressure is probably not the best thing. Thank you for your attention.